Good evening and a very warm welcome to Stroud Book Festival 2020, wherever you're joining us from. My name is Caroline Sanderson and I'm Artistic Director of the Festival. I can't quite believe that after five days of online events, our festival finale is here. But it's an event that I've been hugely looking forward to because this writer and her work are very special to me. And we're also delighted to be staging this event in association with Stroud Valley's project for reasons which will become clear as we go along. Now, six years ago, in my day job as a books journalist, I read an advanced copy of a book called H's for Hawk by Helen MacDonald. Its portrayal of wildness and the wildness of grief had a profound effect on me personally, especially as my father had died only a few months before. And I knew instantly that it was something very special. Actually, anyone could see that. And indeed, it went on to win a whole raft of awards. Now Helen has produced a book of essays, Vesper Flights. They're wonderfully diverse in tone and style, but almost all of them reflect on an aspect of how we humans interact with nature and on its potential to instruct us. She writes, Animals don't exist in order to teach us things, but that is what they have always done, and most of what they teach us is what we think we know about ourselves. I couldn't be more thrilled that Helen is here with us tonight for our Stroud Book Festival finale. Welcome, Helen. Thanks so much for being here. And this is such a pleasure. I have really fond memories of hanging out with you in Stroud. It's a place that I know really well. I've visited many times on the holidays many, for many years. I've got many friends. So hello, everyone. And hello, everyone not in Stroud watching this. It's great to be here. Thank you. So just uh, uh, just before we start, just to say that um, if you'd like to ask questions, please put them on the YouTube chat and we will try and get them in uh, later, as many as we can. So um, I've returned many times to that first conversation that we had where I was lucky enough to interview you before H's for Hawk, H's for Hawk was published. Now, looking back, how did it feel to have that very private journey, um, that very private time in your life, read by so many people, and then to see what a chord it was striking with, with so many as well? well? People often talk about the, you know, the different stages of grief. It's a, a theory I kind of have issues with. It doesn't seem to work like that for me, but um, I do think that a sudden success out of nowhere in the book, it kind of worked a bit like that. To start with, it was I was just bewildered the whole thing was completely bonkers. It felt like the, the book was something that had nothing to do with me, that I was kind of tagging along behind it. Um, and then a few things happened that sort of made me feel that something must have happened. I remember the, the point where I, I could afford to buy a car that didn't break down every 10 miles. That was a huge deal. I was driving along thinking, this is because of my book. Um, as for the emotional side of it it was really strange you know when I started writing that book I initially began writing uh, in a much more British reserved way and I didn't put much too much of my emotional state in and it didn't work I, I mean I kept trying to write and I'd run up against a brick wall it just wouldn't go anywhere and then I realized I had to go kind of full disclosure and write about really the deepest parts of my emotional state at the time and as soon as I realized that it began to flow but so much time had um, elapsed between those events and my writing I mean it's about seven years although I remembered it all very clearly that I was able to write about myself back then as a character and that was really insulating so even though I was kind of exposing the deepest heart of myself it was the deepest heart of a past self and I think everyone knows I'm sure you know everyone who's lost a loved one knows that you build yourself into a kind of new person after you've lost someone you love a new person that can hold that grief within yourself and bear it um, so quite a lot of the time writing that book, I was quite cross with this person I was writing about. I thought she was a complete idiot. Um, and that's, that's made it a, a much easier thing to deal with afterwards. Um, and, and in terms of how meeting people felt, you know, I met so many readers over the time I toured that book. And so many of them shared with me stories of grief and loss and, and, and dark times in their lives, often of a magnitude far greater than mine. And, um, I mean, it sounds really, really sort of cheesy, but it really did teach me a very obvious lesson I think I should have realized many years before, and that is that we all go through these times. We just don't like to talk about them. And it, it made me a lot softer, and it's made me feel that life is a lot more precious than I used to, that it's something that's not very long, and we're not here for very long, and, and we should do our best to love what we see when we see it. So that's the, that's the journey. 
Now, um, in Vespa Flights, we have a book of 41 essays. Uh, it's a very book, different book in form from H's for Hawk, but still personal in many ways and still addressing many of the same preoccupations. Can you say something about the essay form and what it enables you to do as a writer? I think we often think of essays as this sort of chore thing that we have to do at school, don't we? But its um, I always think it's worth remembering that the word essay comes from the French, es essay, uh, an, an attempt. Yeah. Yeah, they're always attempts to solve puzzles. Um, and they, the, the essays in this book come from very many different um, they sort of instigation of each essay is very different. Some of them were written as commissions for various newspapers or magazines. Some of them um, were kind of almost like letters to people, like almost in a way. Um, and others were just things that I, I suddenly got kind of puzzled by or interested in and tried to solve in this in this form and it always feels a bit like a kind of a conversation with a reader obviously one-sided because i've you know no one's actually there but they feel very generous like that they feel like conversations uh and i always hated this word essay it was this word that gave me the sort of screaming abdabs really you know i was the kind of kid who never did this homework i was constantly in trouble at school and university i never wrote my essays and i, I realized that um part of that was i'd been taught that to write an essay you had to kind of plan out what was going to be in it you had to have an introduction and you had to kind of paragraph by paragraph track your argument and have a conclusion. And then once you've done that, you could start to write it. And I found that really paralyzing. And, and um, I was fine in exams, which is a bit more like kind of whitewater rafting. You know, you start with an idea or a sentence and you chase it down the page. And sometimes there's a lot of backpedaling or back um, paddling. And, and sometimes you cross stuff out, but eventually you reach somewhere. And that's how I write essays. And I really love that. And most of the essays in here were written exactly like that. I never knew where they were going to end up. Uh, and sometimes in the middle of them, they would take kind of, you know, wild diversions, I thought, and end up somewhere else completely. They're really exciting. I mean, I love writing longer books, but I think there's something about my brain that really, really adores essays. And I really, you know, I don't want to stop writing them. Um, and also with the pandemic, you know, I don't know about, you know, it's not, it's a terrible time. It's a grim time. And I, I, you know, my concentration span is shot to pieces. I can't concentrate on a, you know, a half hour TV program without playing match three games on my phone or making toast. So I quite like the idea that this has come into the world at a time when these tiny, short, compact things um, might be helpful for people or useful. You can just pick one up and read one and put it down again. Yeah, they're def definitely perfect for that. Um, the subject matter is hugely wide ranging. Um, yeah. I've written down here taking in swifts, nests, glowworms, the migration of birds over Manhattan, ants, hares, mushrooms, I could go on. Uh, very diverse, but they all have, as I said earlier, um, this common theme, I guess, which is how we interact with nature. Um, can you say something about how that's evolved to be such a preoccupation for you? Yeah, I mean, analytically and intellectually, a lot of that has come out of my former career as an academic historian of science. Um, I started off um, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a biologist. Uh, I have no mathematical skills at all. I can't do math. So I ended up sort of giving that dream up and reading English. But at the same time, you know, the natural history stuff was always, you know, really important to me. And when I read English, I realized that there was a way of looking at books. You know, this is what happens when you read English at university. You understand that, you know, you don't just read books for the stories. You, you read them to understand um, a lot of the sort of social and cultural milieu they were written in, they're, they're kind of keys to the past and past ways of thinking. And then I, after university, I went off and bred falcons in the Middle East for um, conservation, um, you know, as you do after an English degree. And I realized when I was out there, I kept seeing all these um, conservation initiatives um, to preserve the birds used in traditional Arab falconry. And they kept failing because they the people that were kind of trying to sort out these programs were paying almost no attention to the deep sort of, you know, importance of these birds in, in Arab culture and to the falconers. And I thought, I, I can maybe do something like this. I can look at animals and look at the natural world the same way I looked at books. I can use those skills. So I went back to university and I, I read a, an M for the history of science. And, and I did just that. I looked at the history of natural history and using those critical skills. And that's where a lot of this comes from. It's that sense of, you know, I always think of it, um, there's a great, great quote from Baudelaire. Um, you know, the greatest, I think it was stolen by the usual suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever played was to persuade us that he doesn't exist. And I think that's what we do with nature. You know, we are told that 
nature is free of human meaning, right? It's, it's, it's a safe place. It's a, it's a refuge from that. And in fact, we just, we pile human meaning into it. You know, we, we, um, we hide our deepest thoughts inside the natural world and we, we see them reflected back at us. And then we use that to prove the truth of those ideas back to us. It's a bit like seeing a weasel and thinking, you know, it's like a kind of wolf of Wall Street. It's a kind of predatory, you know, creature. We, 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 we load animals all the time with that with that kind of thing and i'm just fasc- it's it's endlessly fascinating and and particularly now with the with everything kind of on the precipice i think it's really important for us to try and understand why we value certain creatures and landscapes the way we do because you know that's why we might want or not want to preserve them talking of creatures i have a small oh, good this, evening this but <laughs> this is Burdul who is being very patient and hates it when i do events because he likes to be are you going to hang out yeah, this is my pet parrot. He's 17 years old. Um, he's not very good at talking, um, but he's extremely good at getting his own way. So I thought I'd just say hi. I think the trouble is, it, yeah, well, I, I think thought, the trouble is if he, we might see him later. If trouble is if he stares on, stays on screen, I should just be looking at him and I won't be concentrating on no, what I'm is, doing. He's much, much more fun than, to look at than I am. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't carry on. Mean it like that. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, now, there's many, many pieces in here that I love, and I'm not going to pick a favourite. They're all my favourites. So I, mean, I thought we'd perhaps take an example and for um, let's let's do an obvious thing, perhaps, and talk about the title essay, Vesper Flights. And of course, got this glorious, glorious jacket um, design, uh, Chris Wormel, who also Chris oh, he's, Wormel. he's wonderful and also designed the cover for H's for Hawk. Those of you, those of you who have a copy will recognize it. But uh, obviously, um, Vesper Flights refers to this extraordinary bird here, the swift. Um, and I think, uh, you know, swifts, I mean, certainly for me, you know, they occupy such a special but sort of fleeting presence in our lives, the way that they come and go. Um, and in your essay, for Vesper Flights, I mean, I think this is one way that you, in a way, you sort of try and free um, the, you know, the animal subjects of your essays from the things that we load on them. And, and, and I think, you know, Swifts are just such, I, I was looking in my AA book of British birds before I came out and the huge <laughs> illustration of the Swift and is the most otherworldly creature. And I think this essay really brings that home. You know, in fact, there are two essays about Swifts in the book, but the sheer wonder and the recent, but also you couple that with the recent scientific research, what we know about what they do, which is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's so incredible. just give us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, just talk about the science briefly, you know, I, 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 you know, again, from this historian of science kind of background, and, you know, there's, there's a sort of strong sense in our culture that we think of science as subtracting beauty and mystery from the world somehow. Um, and this essay, part of what it does, I think, is to sort of try and get across the fact that the, you know, scientific research can um, lead to understandings of the way the world works that are absolutely full of wonder. So, yeah, I mean, um, swifts, they've always been really interesting birds for me, um, partly because I couldn't get anywhere near them when I was a kid. You know, I, I used to sort of stomp around with my East German binoculars around my neck, you know, looking at all these birds. And I sort of felt I got to know them because I could see them do things like preening and eating and sort of snuggling up to one another and stuff like that. And there were these birds every year that appeared in May and left in August. And I could never see them closely because they were too fast. They never landed. They're so aerial. You know, they young birds, once they leave the nests, which are sort of inside little kind of dark holes in churches and, and, and ventilation shafts and roofs, once they leave the nest, they'll spend two years flying perpetually. They never land. Um, they live in the sky like herring live in the sea. They're just phenomenal. I've always thought them a little bit more like angels than anything else. They're, they, they're sort of these sort of weird visitors that almost but don't quite touch us. And this um, this science is is astonishing. Um, so Vesper flights are referred to these um, these amazing ascents that these birds do every morning and every evening. At um, um, they fly up, uh, they just climb and climb and climb and climb, and they reach the apex of these flights at nautical twilight exactly, uh, and then they descend again. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why they do this, and it turns out that they're, what they likely are doing is um, they're getting to a height where they, they kind of break free of the influence of the ground on the weather. Once they breach this kind of boundary in the air, the only wind they feel comes from the sort of oncoming weather systems on, in, in the distance. And they can see clouds maybe 130, 140 miles out on the horizon. They can see stars so they can kind of calibrate their 
um, compasses. They can also see polarized light. Their magnetic compasses get calibrated. Basically, they're finding out exactly where they are and they're working out what they're going to do next. And um, this essay started off, you know, just really being about how bloody amazing Swifts are, but it ended up being this kind of um, almost like a hymn to the the way they can be an example to us, how they can teach us um, how to look ahead for oncoming bad weather, really, in, in, in a much more sort of social sense. And it was written way before the pandemic, but when I read it now, you know, it's all I can think of, you know, those dark clouds on our horizon that we, we didn't see coming. So it's, it's, it's become a much darker essay in many ways now I read it. Um, after the pandemic has had hit us. But also, you know, just when you're talking about science, I can feel the, you know, the goosebumps of, of that, of that science, you know. Um, absolutely wonderful. So um, there's much to wonder at in this book, uh, and it has a, has a kind of global scope in terms of the, the creatures that you, you, you write about. Um, and you're someone who's travelled the world and experienced nature on, on many continents, and where we get that scope in this book, um, and uh, I know that you're, you're, you've been to as far remote as Midway Atoll in the Pacific. You've spent time there with the albatrosses, one of the most remote places on Earth. But I think what you're also keen to say with this book is that nature, nature is everywhere. That sounds an obvious thing to say. But um, uh, but I know that when we when when we did an interview, we spoke by Skype. We, we spent a lot of time talking about the nature of, of lockdown. So you were talking about yeah. the spider's web just up in the corner of your kitchen. And um, because, because we're both crap, crap housekeepers. Um, but also you were talking about the uh, it was just fantastic because it was the time of year when the blue tits and the house martins were were co fight, competing oh, for... It was, it was a nightmare. It was Game of Thrones. I got so stressed about it. I put up some house martin nests along the eaves of my house. I've got a little colony here. Now, I love these birds. They come in, you know, in the spring. They look, look like little orcas, you know, these black and white birds. And, and they nest, you know, they just feel part of my house now. And there's one nest um, before the house martins got back. A, a pair of blue tits had taken over their nest. And I was like, oh, I wonder how that's going to turn out. And it was awful. So, you know, first the blue tits would go in. Then the, then the house martins would crowd in and I'd find bluted eggs on the ground. And then it was like, oh, no. And then, and then you know, they'd retake it. And this is kind of pitched battle. And eventually the house martins sort of took, took the nest. And it was just kind of, I, you know, the, the update was, Caroline, that, you know, a few months later, um, another one, a few weeks later, another pair of house martins came in and they kicked this first pair of house martins out and their eggs. I mean, it was just the most traumatic. You know, I ended up just not going outside. <laughs> I just couldn't go. <laughs> Um, yeah, nature red in tooth and claw. So I, I, I bought a nice uh, blue tit nest box from Waitrose. So that's that's up for next year now. Hopefully <laughs> they'll use that. Oh dear, I was supposed to sort of, you know, it's just the nearest supermarket. That's all right. Waitrose Strand are very good to us uh, here at the festival. Um, yes, so... But I, I just, just to say about the yeah. nature at home thing, though, I mean, I think it's really important. You know, we have this sort of sense, we're always sort of given to believe that the right way to sort of find ourselves in nature is to sort of strike out into the woods, you know, or in the, on the mountains. And you know, I, I, there was a lot of that in the early days of lockdown as well, wasn't there? There was a kind of, you know, oh, you should go out walking. You know, that's the kind of way you'll find solace during the pandemic. And I just kept thinking, you know, what if you're living in a, in a you know, small apartment in a city and you haven't got much financial kind of clout and you can't go anywhere? Like, that's not helpful, is it, really? That's kind of really not helpful at all. And, and you know, I'm more and more over the last few years, I've been thinking about how nature is important, I think, not just in and of itself, but for what it can do for us. As there's a great um, passage in one of Iris Murdoch's books about this thing she calls unselfing. She says, you know, if you're tied up in your own concerns, you're, you're anxious, you're worried, you're panicking, you know, everything is really pressing hard upon you. You know, you can look out of the window and you can see a hovering kestrel, but I have to do the hand movements, I'm so sad. And if you look at the kestrel hard enough, your world, I think, I think the phrase is she says, the world becomes all kestrel. And then you can come back into yourself afterwards and somehow the press of those um, stresses upon you have somehow lessened. And I think you can do that with all sorts of animals. You know, you can do that with a spider. You can try and imagine what it might be like to be a spider. And you can look at a spider and do that. And it sounds like a really small, tiny movement, but it's a kind of radical empathy that can not only, I think, help um, with a sense of being constricted and stuck in a place, but also... I think it exercises that empathy muscle. I think, you know, one of the, you know, obviously we're talking in a sort of rather glorious post-election time in America, but, you know, if there's one thing that I 
we've all seen over the last few years, and that is this extraordinary lack of empathy in the political and social realm. And I think, you know, animals can be a kind of way of stretching that capacity within mm. us. Okay, I'll stop talking now. Please ask no, another no, question. Uh, I'm just, well, I, 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 you, I, you have taken the words out of my, because I, I was, I, I, I love that um uh, it, it kind of sent me thinking I must I must read that bit Naris Murdoch because that's so and you, I know that you're slightly impatient with this idea that we hear so often about nature being a solace well of course it's a solace but it, it's it's it's, it's it this sort of idea it sort of suggests that it's there for our benefit doesn't it yeah yeah this kind of instrumental view I mean I, I get kind of I don't know I'm kind of torn you know, there's a, there's a lot of talk now. I mean, there's a lot of science now. I mean, there's the most extraordinary research. You know, I remember while reading one of a, a sort of few months ago about a guy who took some people out. You know, they did he did some cognitive tests about problem solving and kind of business context, and then he took them out backpacking for three days. And it turned out when they got back, they could solve business problems slightly more efficiently and quickly, more quickly. And I'm like, great, that's a good reason to save the natural world. <laughs> I mean, there's a sense of the you know. Again, in many cultures, like you know, Korean, for example, there's a sort of sense of forest bathing as being a, a you know, a, it's it's you know, it's very strongly part of a, a cultural tradition in which you know, going to nature is part of uh, fixing things that aren't quite, quite quite aren't quite right in one's mental health or need some sort of solace. But I think there are ways in which that there's a real problem for me. You know, I think about the woods around here. There are some really beautiful woods around here that. If you walk in them as a human, they look pristine, you know, but they've been eaten to almost to death by deer. And um, they used to be full of nightingales, but all the understory that the nightingales nested in has been eaten away. So for a nightingale, these, these forests look like deserts. They're completely uninhabitable. For us, they look fine. And I think, um, you know, the, the notion that nature is there for our benefit traduces what it is. I mean, it, we can't even imagine how complicated nature is. You know, I, I think about the fact that one spoonful of forest soil, soil can contain up to a billion you know, cells of, you know, bacteria and fungi. I mean, it's the plenitude out there that we don't see and don't understand is just so extraordinary. It makes me think of the, all the kind of billionaires wanting to go to Mars. It's like, wh why? You know, one teaspoon of soil has more life on it than like, you know, a billion Marses, you know, it's it's a really interesting thing to puzzle mm. over. I'm going to get my high horse here. No, I, I, um, I, I yeah. love that. And I, th I think um, I th this is this is absolutely one of the reasons why I, I love your writing, because it's so beautiful to read. And yet it's very bracing. You know, um, it, it, it's, you know, a relationship with nature isn't something as you said, it shouldn't just be something for the privilege. And this is, um, you know, very much, you know, when I mentioned Stroud Valley's project, yeah. that's very much their, their philosophy that, um, you know, for sure nature has is, is very beneficial and they work with a lot of vulnerable people and people um, with mental illness and so on. And you absolutely see the benefits of that, but also that it's, mm. that it isn't something for the privilege and also really that it shouldn't be romanticized. I think we often think about nature writing as, you know, you have notions of country gents in tweeds sort of striding out and waxing lyrical in their notebooks. And, 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 and I feel that, you know, um, it's often been quite a male preserve as well. And I know you could reel off, you know, any number of wonderful female nature writers but i i feel that you're you're slightly at odds with that and um you know a bit on the margins no, there's, you swearing. Know? there's swearing and jokes in my books i think that's partly <laughs> what i do differently um but seriously though i mean i think um yeah traditionally it's been very male and I, i've loved those books you know that that kind of authoritative voice that i've always sort of rather loved the fact that sometimes you read it and basically that what you're getting from the book is you know here is a plant or here is an animal this is what it means. Aren't you lucky to have me to explain this to you? You know, I kind of love that. And it's really hard not to fall into that voice when you're writing about nature. It's like, oh, I'm doing the David Attenborough voice. I did some uh, documentaries for the BBC over the last few years. And quite often when we're filming, I'm, I have to, they sort of cut, they say cut, you know, we need to, could you do, you're doing Attenborough again. Could you just be you? And it's like, you should have fallen into it, right? So um, the, this book is more political than the last one. And I think it had to be, um, partly because the world's, has became so much more savagely um, scary since 2014 in many, many ways, although it's been terrible for many people throughout. Um, and as for the, the sort of who gets to write about nature thing, yeah, I mean, nature's a really various place, and so are all the practices that, that take us to it and how we interact with it. And there is a wonderful 
flourishing a, a, a more interest in in uh, in different voices now, thank God. And I mean, of course, my, my job is to amplify those. I, I, I um, so um, there are many, many um, more women. There are many more trans people, gay people, people of color, black writers. You know, um, J. Drew Lam- yes, Lanham. Yes, give us a few names. That would be really interesting. Yeah, J. Drew Lanham, I think, is probably, uh, I would just say anyone who hasn't read The Home Place by J. Drew Lanham should just go and buy a copy. He's the most astonishing black American ornithologist, the most lyrical, um, deeply felt um, book. I've I cried throughout it. It's just astonishing. And it's full of, like, you know, amazingly beautiful place writing and home writing, but also it's about what's it like to go out and do a bird survey when you have a pair of binoculars around your neck in a really scary area in the south and you're a black man right like the, it's 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 a very very important book and i think any everyone should read it um another book i think everyone should read is um braiding sweet grass by robin wall Kimmerer. that's a um indigenous american botanist uh woman whose book is the most exquisite contemplation on how it's possible to think about nature in a different way than we've been taught by the traditions of the West. So it talks a lot about rep- reciprocity, about gift giving, about, um, she talks about this amazing moment when she talked to her students and said, what would it feel like if you believed that the earth loved you back? And that line has, I, it's never going to go away. I mean, it's, it, it, it just blew me away reading that book. What would it feel like if you felt the earth loved you back? You know, how would you treat it differently? So, yeah, she's amazing, too. But there's, there's millions of people. Um, just get out there and, 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 and find them. Yeah. And that, uh, it's, yeah. it's so interesting what you say about um, Vesper Flights being a more overtly political book. And uh and just, I thought a lot about, because you, you, you said this to me before, you, you, you thought a lot about that thing of, um, you know, putting yourself in the head, truly sort of putting yourself, trying to put yourself, trying to put yourself in the head, of, in, in, in the mind of an animal or the body of an animal, where you were talking about Iris Murdoch. And, and I think you said something like that, well, that's what you should just do as a human being, right? Try and imagine what it's like to be in someone else's skin. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was one of those children. I think probably all children do it. But I just assumed when I was small that everyone was like me. This is a terrible mistake. <laughs> and I think, you know, just to be an adult is to to, to realise that everyone has different histories and different backgrounds and the world treats them differently to you. And I, I just, you know, the, the, the notion that one, I don't know, exists in this kind of world of similarity is, you know, and it. I mean, I guess it comes in concert with understanding privilege in a kind of really serious way too you know um the world should humble one and um yeah so yeah we should just we should just try harder to think our way into other people's minds it's an it's impossible but it's also very very important yeah i mean i mean it isn't it isn't a polemical book i'm not very good at shouting at people there are, there are writers who are very good at that um i just wanted to say look look here this is what we still have this is what we've lost and um this is why it's so important mm-hmm. Um, so just, it's almost like bearing witness, I think, this book, rather than shouting at someone to tell them to stop, you know, doing one thing or another. But I mean, there are some really big points in it. You know, one of the things that I'm very exercised about is how we, you know, for example, with climate change, we've, we've always been told that the way to fix it is to, you know, drive a little bit less, maybe use different light bulbs. Um, when what's required is, is extremely large scale, scale structural change to the way the world is, is, is arranged. And I think, you know, it's, this notion that it's our individual consumer responsibility rather than, you know, we need to, we need to get out there and we need to raise our voices and cause some good trouble. So there's quite, there is some quite serious um, stuff in here, but there's no yelling. So um, don't worry if you're thinking of buying this book, I won't be shouting at you. Yet. But I think you, you, what you, what you do really well is, is connect, you know, you write about, um, about, uh, it is a book about loss in the sense of you, you write a lot about the places that meant so much to you as a child, the place where you, places where you rambled, where you really learned to love and observe nature. And so I think, and, and then, and then you lament their, their loss. And um, I think what you do really well is make that personal loss, um, you know, symbolic of, of all our losses in that sense. 
It is strange. I mean, nostalgia is a very odd thing. You know, as we grow, the the, the familiar things around us when we were young, when we were young, disappear. You know, and it, there's sort of temptation. You know, that you know, I look back and I think of happy eaters on trunk roots and Vesta paella. You know, freeze dried food and angels of light. And I, you know, I miss all those things. I mean, I'm not all of them actually, but but I, you know, they're gone. Um, but also a lot of the creatures that I knew as a child, those great unwinding flocks of lapwings, you know, the corn buntings, the turtle doves, they've all gone too. And for, for a while, it kind of, I realized that I was starting to feel about biodiversity loss, the way I felt about getting gray hair and, you know, getting wrinkles. It just happens as you get older. And that's just bullshit, isn't it? I mean, that's not the way of the world. That's just how it has been in my lifetime. We've lost, I think, over 350 million birds from Europe since I was born. It's terrifying, um, but trying to kind of pull apart the nostalgia for things that were there when you're young and the things that should be there is really important, I think, mm. yeah. And you said, um, uh, uh, when we talked before, you said something really interesting about the word apocalypse and its original meaning. You said it's a revelation of things that were always there, but which we hadn't noticed. Yeah, that was that was really cool when I found that. I got really excited. I might even got up from my desk and sort of ran around the kitchen a bit because I was trying to. I was thinking at that point. I was thinking about um, COVID and how. Do you remember when COVID started? There were all those YouTube videos of animals returning to cities and how suddenly you know the swans were back in Venice. There was a sort of apocalyptic vibe to it all, but the apocalyptic vibe was. Um, Strictly speaking, exactly that. This notion that the apocalypse is not the final end of things, but the revelation of things that have always been there we haven't seen before. And there are all these sort of shots of the, the canals in Venice. Suddenly they're blue. They haven't been stirred up by boats anymore. And you can see fish in them, right? So the fish have always been there. They haven't suddenly appeared. It's just they're now visible. And um, I think right now what's going on with with climate, the climate emergency is that I think that we are in the apocalypse. Um, it's not necessarily the end of things. I think this can be the end of a lot of things that we have taken for granted as as COVID is, is doing. But I think it's also a revelation of things that we can see for the first time very clearly. And now we can see them, we have to act. So, and keep keeping hopeful is hard. You know, I, I think a lot of that Rebecca Solnit's take on this, I'm going to paraphrase her very badly here, but she says, you know, if you're if you're really despairing, you, you don't do anything, right? You, you just give up. Um, if you're very optimistic about the future, you don't bother doing anything because you think it's going to be fine. What you need to do is work really hard to open up a space for uncertainty about the future. And that's where the hope has to be. And it's hard work. It's a discipline keeping hopeful. And um, a lot of the time at the moment, I, I you know, it's had a bit of a boost the last couple of days, but basically trying to keep hopeful is, is where is where I have, you know, it's hard. It's hard and it's important. And I spend a lot of time working on that. Now I'm just going to very rudely look at my look at my mobile device here to see. Um, we've got some questions, I hope, from from people oh, cool. watching. But um, while, while I do that, um, your your dad, oh. you, you, who is, um, you know, of course, in H's for Hawk, uh, he's here, too. And maybe we can share a particular essay because it's quite short. And um, we've said a lot that's very serious and urgent, quite rightly, in this uh, conversation. But um, I know, I know, there's, yeah, I know there, there, <laughs> there's also a lot of lightness and humour um, uh, in this book. So, um, yes, you know which right. one I want you to okay. read, don't you? It's the ghost one. It's the it? ghost, it's ghost one. one. I still don't know whether he'd be furious or delighted that this is in the book. I suspect he might be furious. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dad. It's just called Goats. It's, um, yeah. As a child, I discovered a simple game that's good to play with goats. You lay your hand flat on a billy goat's forehead and push just a little. You push and it pushes back. And then you push harder and it does too. And it's a little like arm wrestling, but much more fun. And the goat always wins. I told dad about my love of pushing goats once. Just as an aside, we were talking about something else. And he must have filed this information away because about a year later, he came home very crossly. And he was cross with me. And this was a very rare thing. In his capacity as a press photographer, he spent the day at London Zoo taking photographs for their annual animal census. And at one point, he happened to be standing with the rest of the press pack in the petting zoo. And there, 
he sees a goat. And he says to everyone, watch this. I hadn't explained activity very well because he puts his hand against the goat's forehead with everyone watching. Then he pushes. He pushes really hard and the goat falls over. There's this long silence broken only by the sound of photographers and journalists saying, Jesus, Matt, and what the fuck? The goat gets up, stares at him, and runs away. And the press pack never let him forget the time he pushed a goat over in front of all of them. And it was all my fault. <laughs> God, he was, so, he was so cross with me. He was so cross, that poor goat. He must have been so baffled. I'm very sorry to you. Don't Both try this at home, me. we perhaps should say. Don't try this at home. It is really good, though. I mean, it's quite fun pushing goats. But, yeah, don't push really hard without the goat knowing what's going on because it will fall over. <laughs> oh, poor I man. love it. I love it. Poor goats. Poor, poor dad. Um, <laughs> so I have a question here from, oh, Kimberly Ooh. Price. So, um, and uh, Kim is, is involved with the Yellow Lighted Bookshop, another of our wonderful independent bookshops. Hello, who's been, uh, I'm going to just um, have oh, the yes, for a bit let's have here. The Hi, she Kim. says, I know you do know the Cotswolds, so maybe you can answer this. What This time of year in the Cotswolds, what birds should we be looking out for? Um, I was at Slimbridge the other week, so perhaps that's... Slimbridge, yeah. Slimbridge is such a, such a pleasure. Like, you know, I remember, because there's a lot of wildfowl and wetlands trusts around here, and they all tend to have be just wild You're birds. You're in uh, but Suffolk, something, we should tell people, about... aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, we're in, yeah, I'm in Suffolk. There's something about going to Slimbridge and you know you can go and see the wild ducks, you know, the kind of these, you know, maybe, but also there's loads of tame ones. And I remember going there a few years ago and, and feeding a bunch of smews, which are my favourite duck, these tiny little diving ducks. They look a bit like icebergs. And there was something about them reaching across and I could feel their little soft throats. Oh, God, it's still the cutest thing I've ever done. It's still, I'm sorry, I'm going to get really excited about, about tame ducks now. Um, this time of year in the Cotswolds, one of my favourite things that happen um, is the field fairs come in. And the field fairs are, as many of you know, I'm sure you know, Kim, these big, bold Arctic thrushes. They look a bit like kind of song thrushes that have kind of somehow put on armor. They're spotted and gray and very, very bold. And they have this incredible sound. It's a chuck, chuck, chuck noise. It's a bit like someone throwing a handful of gravel onto an icy pond surface. And they are uh, surface. And they have these great ragged flocks um and, and as soon as i hear that noise i just know winter's here and when they come it always feels a bit like they've brought some of the arctic with them under their feathers it's, it's just magical um so field fairs i love the the arctic swans at Slimbridge and along the seven um and just other things too like robins for example you know robins have this beautiful winter song they sing it's slightly different from the summer song and very few birds are singing now so there's something very melancholy and icy about listening to a robin singing even if you don't go near any rarer birds that's a real winter mm. treat oh that's something and, and you've got a bit about oh he, he. <laughs> keeps popping out for a for a look at what's going on yeah. who the hell is oh, that yeah. he's saying i'm seeing a deck chair <laughs> for the pattern. oh we come back come back to you in a minute i promise i just wanted to say that there's um there's a wonderful chapter about uh, wax wings in your uh, essay about wax wings in your book and I still never seen one of those and I remember in my ladybird book I think it must have been just being transfixed by these birds that look like they've got you know <laughs> so cool they really do like Christmas ornaments or aliens they're they're amazing and they will only ever appear in you know the sort of shopping centers when you don't expect them um, and you know I, I mean honestly PC PC warehouse you know Outside, you know, 24-hour boots, you know, outside home base, suddenly you'll look up and there'll be a little sorbus tree and it'll be full of these bizarre creatures that look at that out of Star Trek and then they'll just swirl away again. They're so exciting. If you really want to see wax wings, then I recommend you go on one of the local bird watching message boards. Um, there are always these kind of like excitable sort of messages going, you know. Head to the industrial estate right now. They're on the hedge by the back of the car park. Well, yeah, that's a yeah. top tip. Really I'm, cool. uh, yes, I'm. Uh, yeah. So, Badul, you've had uh, for quite a while now, I think, haven't you? And uh, he's, he, you post wonderful photographs of him up to all sorts of things uh, on your on your social media. So, uh, yeah. what's his, what's his favourite? Uh, oh, look at that. <laughs> no, he's, ter he's terribly, terribly cute. What's some what's of his, his favourite favorite, uh, occupations at the, at the moment? Fighting me, being grumpy. You know, I've, I've kept hawks for years and um, 
when I got a parrot, everyone was like, oh, it's emotionally like far more healthy. <laughs> and, um, you know, I've got more scars from this bird than I ever have had from a hawk. Um, his favorite things, having baths, um, trying to eat my ice creams, if I'm having ice cream. Um, he has a whole selection of various words that he can almost say properly. So he says, how are what you're doing? Um, he likes having shower. Yeah, that's I'm talking to you. Also, quite recently, it's really funny. He's developed this. He sleeps in my room, the cage upstairs. And um, in the middle of the night, sometimes he'll do these amazing impersonations, it seems, of Owen Wilson going, wow. <laughs> so he'll just in the middle of the night just go, wow. I was like, what? Is it? It's really funny. But I mean, he doesn't. I've learned sort of noises from him and he's learned some English from me. And we have this kind of weird language, which is kind of halfway between the two. He understands, you know, a lot of words. And um, he's you really fun. then, just a little... Whack. That means what's going on. Oh, you might well ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I might right, well I'll ask. No, bye bye, bad uh, No, he's good. He's, he's, he's good. Oh, no, it was great, great that I, I always hope whenever I speak to you that he's going to be uh, uh, appear at some point. So, so, yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased he graced us with his presence. Now, um... One of the many write it out and frame it quotes from this book is this. Literature can teach us the qualitative texture of the world and we need it to. We need to communicate the value of things so that more of us might fight to save them. And that feels like a most excellent thought for the finale of a book festival. It's, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't. You can't love something if you don't know it's there. And um, a lot of the stuff around us, we just don't see. And that's not because we're kind of, you know, stupid or ignorant or whatever. It's just that we don't see it. Um, so I think my job is just to sort of maybe point at some things and say, look, look at this. Look what it's, look at what surrounds us and look at what's still there. And, um, you know, let's let's do our best to maintain that, not just for ourselves, but for our future generations. It's a it's. Um, it's not hard to point out beauty. It's not a hard job to do. And it's, it's, uh, it's just, it's kind of sometimes hard emotionally because some of these things are very, very threatened. But, you know, there's this kind of plate glass wall, I think, in our minds between us and the natural world quite often. I kind of miss those days where you could go out and kind of, you know, it was fine to catch newts and get your hands dirty. There's a sort of sense that we're not supposed to touch it. It's too precious. And, um, you know, I'm not recommending we do all of these things anymore. They're no longer illegal. But um, I do sometimes wish that we had more hands-on, visceral kind of connection to things, you know. Um, I, I remember watching a, a, a couple of parents with a toddler telling them not to pick up sticks because they were dirty a few months ago, and I got kind of really sad about it. Um, and it's kind of noxious of me, but it's like, oh, you know, there's a lot of kind of interesting information in a stick, you know, like they're really cool, so... But I have a lot of hope. You know, I, I saw a man recently um, who'd parked up in a big, you know, one of those SUVs that generally kind of dictates the person inside them are probably quite obnoxious drivers. And um, he'd actually got out, out of this SUV. The blinkers were on and I was like, oh, you know, what's going on? Something. And there was a, a couple of ducks in a pond, a mallard and a couple of uh, quite well-grown ducklings in this little pond on the road, a flash of water. And he was worried they were going to get run over. So he was guarding them and making sure that all the cars that came were stopping and not going to run them over. And I was baffled because there's a river right next to the road. And um, I said, why don't you just, you know, sort of shepherd them back to the river? And he said, you know, they look like they're having fun. So, you know, it's nice to sort of think that there are these unexpected moments where people you don't expect somehow get it and um, yeah. do their best too. It's a really nice sort of thing to see. It's funny, you know, when you were talking there, I was thinking um, our previous event was with Dara McAnulty and I know there's a bit in his book where um, I think there's some parents who express horror when their child picks up a feather, you know, and I just thought, you know, because feathers, I mean, I pick up feathers all the time because they're just the yeah. most gorgeous things it's um well we just we just taught we just taught to feel things are scary and dirty and things and that's just you know it's it's not a criticism of anyone in particular for thinking that or or, or, or trying to communicate it to their kids and they're just worried about them but there is a sense in which i think it's seeing danger in the world where there really isn't danger um and some of the big dangers in the world we we just just go unnoticed so yeah it's a kind of a bit of a bit of a all right all right sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's becoming the parrot show 
All right, you can come and say hi. So he's a yeah. He's a, go then, on, sorry. He's a he's a cinnamon green cheeked uh, conure. He's going to come down here now. So, but yeah, but the next thing is the uh, albatrosses. So um, I'm really excited about that. I'm doing a big book uh, next on basically on the end of the world, another cheerful subject. Um, so it's going to be set on Midway Atoll in the Pacific, and it will be um, about albatrosses and sea level rises and the U.S. military and uh, lots of things that I think are really cool. And I was meant to be there this last summer, and I couldn't go because of the pandemic. And next summer looks out too, so it's going to be a while, this book. So, But that gives me a chance to really think about it properly, so I'm looking forward to that. It gives me that. a chance to get my invitation in for you to come back and tell us all about it. I'll be oh, back. that's I'll so be good back. to hear. Now, this question um, makes me really happy, and I tell you why, because obviously when we – so one of the wonderful, wonderful things about doing an online book festival, there are lots of things that I don't like about doing it online because I would love to be in the same room as you, for example. Um, but it does mean that I hoped that people would watch from – from far away. And in fact, if it will come back on my, sorry, I'm being very ham fisted here. Um, Vishal from New York City. Hi, Vishal. Has a question. In Sunbirds mm -hmm. and Kashmir Spheres, you recount your disappointment in not witnessing the golden Orioles at the Poplar Plantation. Could you tell us more about what makes seeing these birds so different from hearing them? Oh, it's so cool. Um, so they have this, uh, anyone who doesn't know, the golden orioles are really common across much of the world. They're just really, really rare, almost extinct in Britain. In fact, I think they are extinct as a breeding species now. And they, they reappeared in Britain um, in the sort of 60s, I think, or 70s. I, sorry, the parrot's biting me now. Go over there. Um, there are these match plantations, these poplar plantations to make um, safety matches in these flat area of Britain called the Fens. And these, these um, golden orioles reappear. They came from the Netherlands. They flew over. They sort of set up home and... You know, in these days of kind of Brexit and immigration, you know, fear, I mean, it's always made me laugh that they were never considered to be immigrants. They were kind of lost natives that were returning. And they are bright, bright yellow. The male Orioles look like um, they're canary yellow with these black wings and red beaks. They're beautiful creatures. Um, and they also have this amazing song, this sort of fluting kind of <laughs> kind of song. It's like a, it's a, it's a, there's a timbre to it that you don't hear in any other British bird. You'll hear it all the time in France in the summer if you go to, you know, on the continent. So um, hearing them was magnificently strange and evocative and, and sort of almost made me you know, cry, like most things. But seeing them, I wanted to see them. And um, it was one of the, the, those moments where I began to realize that we're so used to seeing birds in field guides as um, these kind of perfect shapes you know they, they're like almost like diagrams of a bird you know they haven't got a background they're just sort of there on the page and then you know, I, I was trying to see these orioles in in this sort of poplar forest just constantly moving all these leaves and all I could see were patches of an oriole you know there was sort of a little bit of a wing bar or a flash of a tail um and it made me realize again you know that sort of sense that the, the, the habitat and the bird are kind of they're part of each other you know you can't really divide one from the other and then I saw this bird and you know, it actually did see almost almost all of him, and he um, was like a kind of like a golden coin in in, in the in, in in the in the trees. And I think, you know, part of the reason that bird was such a rich experience for me was because I knew how rare it was. You know, I knew this was a remnant population hanging on of a population of immigrants, and um, you know, in, indeed, it was. I think one of the last years that they bred in this place. So, it was beautiful and it was rare, and it sounded like the past it sounded like history and um i was very lucky to see it so yeah yeah they're really cool birds it's a wonderful essay as well but it just reminded me as you were talking that i was at slimbridge not not that long ago and i was there with my east german binoculars around my neck and um uh, and and i know there'd been avocets out there and avocets for me were as a child where um you know it was the rspb bird and you know i always wanted to see them but I knew that they'd said there were avocets there. And there I was, and you were talking about their part of their habitat, and I could see them on the kind of sand flats thinking, it's black and white. Is it an avocet? I couldn't quite it's see. An it's an avocet. It's an avocet. Actually, it's really funny. Avocets, you know, again, it was exactly the same rhetoric. So when they, 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 they came here because a lot of their um, habitat in, in the continent had been destroyed because of World War II uh, military you know, defences, so a whole bunch of them ended up in Havergate Island in, 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 in Britain. 
And again, we, we treated them as returning natives because we, they were really pretty. <laughs> we really liked them and we sort of protected them. And um, they're so common now that I've heard bird watchers call them chavasets, which is, you know, kind of grim for lots of reasons, but made me laugh the first time I heard it. So hooray for, hooray for the avocets. Well, I, I still, ch- chavasets or not, I still I get a bit of a thrill from seeing them, they're I have beautiful, to say. They're beautiful. Um, yeah. uh, question from Kath. How do you get people to look more closely at nature in urban lockdown? I teach creative writing and often on a nature theme. I find most people don't see details so I think she's sort of after tips for workshops here so maybe this is a writing question yeah. because you know your descriptions of are, are phenomenal and you obviously you know you you th- the way that you see things and describe them are you, are you able to sort of actually turn that into kind of tips about how you approach that when you're writing it's hard isn't it I mean I think looking at anything for a long time is useful I think that was one of um um, you know, Ezra Pound was politically an extremely dubious person, but he, he, he remembered this. This is where the, I wrote a book of poetry called Shaler's Fish, and that actually um, comes from an observation in one of uh, Ezra Pound's essays, which is about. Oh God, I really am going back now. It's actually a, a quote from an essay by um, an American naturalist called Agassiz, who again was also a politically incredibly dubious person. However, he was trying to teach a, a young biologist about a fish. About and he put this young he put this fish on um, a, 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 on a sort of tray in front of this young biologist and said I want you to write down what you see, and this biologist wrote down would be right you know it's got like dorsal fins and it's got an eye and you know it's got like a tail with this many rad you know radiant sort of spokes on it and blah, 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 how many scales in this lateral line, and then he showed it to the, I guess as you said no that's not what I that's not what you saw that's what you thought you see I want you to write down what you see when you see the fish and then the, the student went away and actually wrote down quite a lyrical description of what the fish looked like and that was what I guess he said you know you want to describe what you see not what you think is there so I think looking at anything for a long period of time and trying to cut your mind off from your expectations but actually try and get down what you can see or smell or feel in the thing in front of you the sensory um, hit of a thing is very important and if it's an animal I mean I, I got really obsessed during lockdown outside my house there was a little uh, zebra spider Sulticus it was hunting on the outside of my house this tiny spider they're, they're amazing I mean they can see the moon they, they've got incredible vision and I spent a lot of time looking at this spider and one of the great things there was that I began to realize that the house didn't just belong to me it was also the spiders so there's a sort of sense there about when you, if you go out into, as a writer into the natural world and you look at a creature or look at a plant, you know, trying to think about it in its place, that it, it you know, it's possessed by the ground that, that it's in or on, just as um, the ground possesses it, you know, they're all, they're all sort of set in place. So thinking about a place, something in relation to where it is, is also quite a useful thing to do. Gosh, that was an incredibly long answer. Sorry. No, um, it's a good yeah. And coffee. Coffee really helps me concentrate. So you could try just giving them a lot of coffee beforehand if they're not too young. <laughs> oh, that's so. And it's a good reminder that you are you're a poet as well. I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, personally think that's that's evident from uh, uh, from your writing. But uh, it's it's good to remind us of that too. Yeah, I haven't written any for ages. I mean, I sort of think to myself that it might be that I think I have things to say now. My poetry was always very um, kind of playful and quite sort of, you know, I thought it was quite difficult. It was quite linguistically kind of naughty and it was really fun to do. It was more like abstract expressionism. You know, it didn't really say stuff directly to a reader. And I, I think at the moment things are urgent enough that I want to ri- write prose. But I'll get, I'll get back to it at some point, I think. I love writing poetry. Now, um, unfortunately, I, I sort of feel that we've got to draw it so close. I could, I could really talk to you, um, for, you too. for forever, really. But um, we, you talk about the fact that every writer, and I, again, this is a great thing to think about at the end of our, of our festival, that every writer has a sort of prevailing theme that runs through all their work. And actually, this is a question I quite often ask when I'm interviewing writers. What, what do you think the thing is that that runs through all your books. Um, so uh, what is it for you? It's love. I am the softest person. Um, and I, I thought it was death. I thought it was bereavement and death when I wrote Hawk. And, you know, there's, there's, it sort of makes me laugh now because, of course, what is grief? But, you know, it really is just love without an object. You know, it's love with nowhere to go, right? So... And um, 
I think about what I'm doing with what I do with Vesper flights and how just to try to communicate the the love that I feel for the glittering profusion of of life that's not us around us. I think love was the only way to go. I mean, but the alternative I think was attention or you know, there's a sort of quality of attention that I try to pay to um to the natural world that um is 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 another theme of the book. And it's just it's just learning how to look. So maybe love and looking, I think, maybe my themes. And um they're good ones, I think. They're good ones. Loving and paying attention and noticing. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely joyous. I can't, I can't tell you. And and um, it just feels like such a wonderful way to bring our our book festival um, to a close. So thank you so much for being with us. And um, we wish you well with Midway when you get there. Uh, yeah, I'll be there with the albatrosses. I'll be there on the sandy albatross things. But I hope to get back to Stroud again before too long. I'll be wandering around up, um, you know, up the hills and. Um, I was remembering the whole cheese rolling situation recently and laughing um the Gloucestershire tradition of rolling cheeses down hills um I miss that part of the world I spent a lot of time in the west country so I'll have to come back so but it's really lovely to be with you virtually Please thank you do. very much thank you so very thank much you. and I hope it's not too long before I see you again in IRL as they say IRL. Thank Take you care, so Anna. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. A reminder that you can buy Helen's book, Vesper Flights. And oh, my goodness, you really should buy it. Um, if that hasn't convinced you, I, I don't know what else to do. From our festival bookseller, Stroud Bookshop, stroudbookshop.com. Please buy it from them or an independent bookshop near you at this very difficult time for independent retailers. And please, so please also consider supporting Stroud Valley's project in its wonderful and vital work. We've got a video on our YouTube channel now which uh, tells you a bit more about it. That's almost it for Stroud Book Festival 2020. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you to all our authors and their publishers and our wonderful chairs. Uh, all our sponsors and everyone who's supported our festival, whether financially or in kind or by giving their time. We're so very grateful to you all in helping us to do this. Um, we'd also like to thank the crack team at MMO UK Studios in Stroud for all their technical expertise in helping us stage this entirely online festival. We absolutely couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thanks also go to Camilla Hale, Dominique Sheed and Jane Churchill for all their dedicated work on the festival. And my personal thanks to my absolutely wonderful festival co-directors, Louise Bryce and Shannon Newton, who are the absolute best people that I think I've ever worked with. I may have been the front woman, but this whole festival has been a massive, massive team effort. So thank you to everyone. And for now, it's good night. Goodbye for 2020. We wish you health and happiness and happy reading and we hope to see you again next year. Good night.